Right. Um, so, uh, drawing displacement, rehabilitating the Victoria language of childhood after the Second World War. Um, I just want to begin this talk with um, acknowledgement to the AHRC, which is funding uh, a three year project um, uh, which supports this paper. And the project is there, just written down there understanding displacement aesthetics and making change in the art gallery with refugees, migrants and host communities. So I begin uh, my talk as well with a, just a reflection on the 1949 um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, just the observation that it does obscure the rights of children in, um, it does refer to children in three articles, 25, 26, 27, and 27 does mention the right to uh, freely, the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and to enjoy the arts. It doesn't specifically refer to children, but children are generally um, in the UDHR included in the universal concept of mankind. Unlike, of course, the Geneva De Declaration of 1924, where they were um, specifically referred to. So th it's interesting to me that there's a sidelining of these documents, sidelining of children in these documents, all the while why bodies like the UN and UNESCO in particular, and UNICEF, UNICEF and particularly UNESCO, are actually um, disseminating this information of human rights to children, as you can see in this picture on the right. And also at a time when UNESCO's central concern was to create concrete projects um, focused on children, such as education programs, and as we'll see in this paper, uh, exhibitions of child art uh, throughout the world, some of which focused on displaced children. Uh, just as a bit of a background to the way in which UNRWA, IRO, um, uh, the International Refugee Organization, um, and many charities in the post-war period uh, did use the arts in camps. And this is just a few examples uh, uh, of a Jewish Polish hidden child whose parents commissioned um, an artist in the camp to, to do a portrait of her because they obviously recovered her after some, some years. And various people in the camps who worked, who either did, were commissioned by um, uh, UNRWA um, staff, such as Ivo Javesky, who got extra food rations for his work and teaching children in camps, or um, of the surroundings, like Richard Kivit, um, who, who was commissioned by the um, director of that particular camp. Or, um, Alfred Gluck is a good example of some of the harrowing, extremely traumatic memories that UNRWA staff encouraged um, talented artists to record their memories in sketches uh, as a way of uh, sort of a, a form of art therapy. Um, and that is because I think that um, there was a growing understanding of art therapy and in different parts of the United States and, and Europe, of course, um, particularly coming out of Austria, and that was starting to filter into the concept of welfare for um, DP uh, uh, inhabitants. Come back to that point. Here's just a couple of examples from the uh, Esma Banner Collection in Australia, who was an Australian DP camp worker. Leather work, textiles, woodwork, a lot of which also focused on children because children was a sort of some, something of a market for desperate parents who'd also had an extremely difficult time during the Second World War. And you can see like the Christmas plate and so forth. But also camp, camp art was about, as many historians have, have discussed, um, Tara Zara and Jessica Reinish, uh, about the way in which cultural traditions re revivifying them normalized displacement and, and, and helped with homesickness and renationalizing um, uh, the, the, the people living there. To awaken the spirit of national pride and feeling. And folk art was very much part, part of that. Similarly, um, uh, you will find folk art stroke occupational therapies were used in both psychological therapy, cultural and religious therapy, and of course, vocational therapy, particularly say for Jewish um, 
DPs who were trying to recover from the extraordinary experience of um, genocide. And um, also this nationalist communal values that could, that could be revived. Um, and this is of course part of, although quite distinct from the way in which UNESCO used the universalist uh, discourse around child art, distinct from the nationalist. So art therapy programs were uh, beginning to be used. They had been used before during the war um, and it to somewhat extent in propaganda purposes uh, all over the world, but also to support um, uh, kinder transport children or um, all sorts of refugee children. Uh, and also as fundraising activities, but I'm looking really at the post-war period. So you'll see here, for example, um, Murray Punnett, who worked in London with um, child uh, children sheltered from the bombs during the Blitz, as well as in the very famous Windermere group, of which there was a recent film that lots of people would have watched. Um, but uh, just to go back to the point that um, Itta Blumenthal, who was quite a sort of well-known art therapist, wrote to UNRWA's Washington office and described, you know, occupational art therapy as a very important way of re reviving children's lives and um, uh, preparing them, at creating a mentally healthy child. So it was very much around mental health. And she followed the Chizek, uh, Franz Chizek idea of child art that came out of Austria in the 1920s, was very influential on certain people, including Mary Punnett. Um, and she worked with 300 Polish Jewish concentration camp teen survivors, um, mostly liberated from Trisienstadt. Um, in Windermere and which is the Lake District. She'd corresponded with Sigmund Freud. She'd had a uh, possible sort of intimate relationship with um, for, uh, Heinz Hartmann, who was the uh, a pupil of Freud's. So art was a process of self-realization and she also worked with this in London with this particular group of 16 year old uh, to 19 year old girls. You can see there on the left um, and um, these are some of the paintings which you see of an uninhabited and abandoned world of teen survivors. And uh, one of them said, one girl, Lena, I wanted to paint a girl there, uh, but I could not. So um, other pictures described in her memoir, Rock the Cradle, what a fantastic title, which had only recently been uh, republished or published, I should say, for the first time. It's an extraordinary read. Um, really harrowing what these teenagers have gone through. And she describes the pictures, the paintings that the kids did, um, at, you know, burning houses. Um, but she makes a really interesting point that a lot of the pictures done in the ghettos were very colourful, or memories of the ghettos, I should say, were colourful, but the ones done about the camps were really dark because they're, and she surmises that's because their families were still alive when they were remembering the get life in the ghettos. Um, she says, the pictures I now saw laboriously produced spoke of the desolation not <clears throat> in each individual child. The work of the child from the camps was painfully accurate and neat with a severe and oppressive restraint in evidence. And this contrasted with the playful art by children sheltered, sheltered in London uh, with, with their families because the Blitz had not shaken the fundamental structures of their lives, she says. Um, and of course the children took themes from their painful memories and also use symbolism and often an extreme sense of fear and aliveness. In April 1948, MoMA staged in New York, Museum of Modern Art staged in New York an exhibition artwork by children of other countries at the Children's Art Centre and it was uh, where the modern art movement and the humanitarian agenda sort of merged really around uh, the education director, Victor D'Amico, um, who was working with the American Overseas Aid United Nations Appeal for Children. And they put this exhibition together with Murray Punnett. So it, uh, she did an art class with DP children who had arrived to be resettled in America and compared and contrasted with the artwork she brought over from the Windermere group. 
And here you have, you can see a little boy here, a, a, a resettled displaced child, comparing his own picture with that of the Windermere group um, of the barracks there. And there she is down here, Murray Punneth, with the, with the recent DP children in the US having a look at the exhibition, there's the way it was staged. Uh, and the photographers were invited in and there's a lot of uh, image culture around this that you can look up on MoMA's website. The press release that was um, issued uh, described the teenagers as, teenagers back in England as now attending school or being gainfully employed in England. Um, and so there's a sort of an uplifting narrative there that the child art, although these pictures are harrowing, it has helped to restore these teenagers, disturbed teenagers to a more, a normal, essentially normal life, to have been socially reformed. So how creativity could transform trauma into the hope for children and young people reinforce the discourse of post-war reconstruction. In the United States, this was, as Amy Ogata suggests, reframed by an emphasis on values of freedom and productivity, upheld as a humanistic ideal and the epitome of democratic personality, that this was to become an ordinary expectation of modern childhood. But I think, I think we do also see children performing a sort of level of emotional labour for the adult world in which it's reassuring that these children have overcome their difficulties. Childhood also was supported by UNESCO's values of universal education and Western democracy. And Julian Huxley, the, the British first director general of UNESCO wrote in his foundation document that self-expression is consonant with the persistence and the progress of society. And the aesthetic creative urge is fundamental to the development of post personality and individualism and uh, the resolution of conflict, the dispelling of, um, of, of frustration, uh, creating self-confidence and liberation, he says. A liberation for this uh, and advancing the child in the strange unknown world that surrounds the child. And that's particularly relevant to DP children. Um, and you can see here that UNESCO also supported the first uh, funding of UNICEF, which um, was in danger in those first early stages, as Dorothy McArdle writes in her uh, important book, Children of Europe. Um, and they <coughs> helped uh, UNESCO to launch the 1949 Child Art Competition in Czechoslovakia, which is really important because um, the parliamentary democracy had been uh, overtaken by communists in the year before. And so here we have a tension between uh, the uh, Czech and Eastern European delegations to um, UNESCO complaining about its anti-Marxist ideology. And yet um, here we have them launch UNESCO launching the Christmas card, oh, sorry, the child art competition, which resulted in uh, Jiska Tsamkova from Czechoslovakia winning the entry that then was created into a Christmas card, posters, schools, and all this sort of thing. By 1952, they sold 1 million of these cards. So there's a sort of diplomacy um, going on there as well in, in terms of child art as well. So, and, and a Cold War, um, uh, I suppose, tension. So to that extent, children's arts being mobilized by different wings of the same UN organization for different purposes as well. Um, but also still with this idea that imagination and creativity is the core to re rehabilitating a concept of innocent childhood. Uh, the emphasis, of course, is that children are free artists and makers, and this is fundamental to that visual ethos. They are offering, apparently, according to the discourse, free unmediated thoughts, democratic voices, and reclaiming, preserving an ideal of their happy, hopeful, and innocent childhood on paper. Uh, but of course, um, to put this in some sort of historical, historiographical context as well, UNRWA, the IRO and other agencies are using art 
in a therapeutic context, um, which was also visualized by UNESCO as in Children of Europe, the famous David Seymour um, publication, um, and in UNESCO's own publications, the Four Year Old Impetus. Um, and here you have Therese, famous images of Tereska and Wojtek uh, showing you know, the, the trauma of their ex memories and experiences. Also over on the right hand side, you have uh, some German children who have depicted uh, a demon torturing mankind down here and um, you know, a, a bomb, bombs instead of flowers to illustrate life today. And this, therefore, UNESCO uses this art to say children need re-education, they need therapy, they need textbooks also need to be revised. Teresa Bross's report on raw handicapped children for UNESCO in 1950 describes young people's psychological damage, apathy and their distrust of adults, their potential dis delinquency and social maladjustment. And she describes a nine-year-old girl drawing herself as a wolf cub at the foot of a leafless tree and set in a desolate, desolate landscape. Um, but she says it's cheering to see how children quickly with a wise teacher trained in these new methods of art therapy can revive the initiative of such children who at last realize happily that they can also have ideas, they can have ideas. Um, and the sort of Western ideological viewpoint in that um, about children also um, can it, can have a creative joy. The free drawing leads to creative joy and that's essential for their individual mental health and growth and also the wider collective development of social harmony. So there's quite a lot being pinned on the child out there really. So you have UNESCO doing two sorts of things, demonstrating as Simone uh, Deliotti writes at Chim, demonstrating abject childhood and you know, in and uh, as Rodonio and Ferenbach write about uh, humanitarian photography. Um, on the other hand, you have this idea of creative joy and UNESCO is um, I I imaging both of those things, um, both, or, both utopian and dystopian visions of childhood, uh, reflecting the precarity of the so-called laboratory of illusions um, that uh, it is that um, UNESCO's director general him uh, Torres Bidet writes in 1949 that you know human rights are not a laboratory of illusions but they are precarious and you see that in the the representations of children and child art it's also worth saying that um, important modern artists like Miro and Matisse were involved um, with UNESCO doing lots of uh, culture work with them around children, for example, looking at the life, at life with the eyes of a child. The artist has to look at life as he did when he was a child. And if he loses that faculty, he cannot express himself in an original, that is personal way. So there was a strong belief among art educationalists at this time that the mark of individuality, uh, that the child artist has a mark of individuality and, and the work of art is transcendental. And this will support the reconstruction of individual child, his mind and personality being, being free to explore and express, to, um, to educate him in his own human rights and his democratic rights and putting the homogenizing passivity of the fascist mindset to the past. Um, but as we've seen that there is also a nationalist element. Uh, so we have this universal element on the one hand, universal childhood, the, the pictorial language of childhood and on the other hand, we have nationalism in, in the DP camps and the use of um, art as a sort of reviving folklore and cultural um, nationalism. Also Trevor Thomas writing for UNESCO, children are creative artists and speaking about the, every, every child has the right to opportunities for creative expression. And that's referring to um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights.
So UNESCO, like many social and art reformers, saw art as one crucial key in uh, development of happy and rehabilitated childhood. In the visual language of humanitarian narratives, organisations like UNESCO sought to find the world's lost, though still innocent children, reclaiming them by instilling free drawing practices and providing children with art materials where they might recover their childhood imaginary through the universal pictorial language of child art that traversed national linguistic and perhaps even ideological barriers between people. However, this was not solely the children's, about children's education for and rehabilitation. The pictorial voice of the child was also for adults and for the public to appreciate, as we saw with the moment exhibition and with much of UNESCO's publications and education work. For a new generation of artists and teachers, such as in the Palestinian refugee camps, displaced artists became teachers of children in the 114 UNESCO-sponsored schools. 19-year-old refugee Ishmael Shamu taught Arabic, arithmetic, history, geography, painting and sculpture, and was called upon to assist and inspire his community in the village of Khan Yunus in Gaza. And in 1950, he enrolled in the College of Fine Arts in Cairo and also held the first exhibition in Gaza in 1953 and the Palestine exhibition in 1954 in Cairo. And interestingly, he becomes a really very famous uh, artist to the Palestinian community. And um, interesting, UNESCO auctioned his watercolors to raise funds for reconstruction. Um, so there is a, an important role that UNESCO is also playing in to support a form of national reconstruction for displaced Palestinians after the 48 war. And uh, of course, with possibly mar market less success. So child art and displaced children's art exhibitions and the work around children's art and, and support for teaching art in camps and in resettlement processes um, performed a set of functions, national, internationalist, universal, psychotherapeutic, emotional labor at a time of intense effort to recover childhood, all the while in the middle of complex Cold War conflict, conflicts and the emergence of new conflicts. Children's pictorial language traversed national boundaries acting as a tool of post-war internationalism, diplomacy, most importantly, this utopian dream of reconstructed childhood innocence. Despite the emphasis on child art, children were acting as symbols, not quite voices or agents, in the UN's emergent discourse of universal human rights, and were arguably embroiled in Cold War ideological positions. And um, thank you for listening.